Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties around the globe to train leaders, develop engagement strategies and empower people to organise for change. And in 2020, or what's left of it, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to make a difference, inspire, give hope and enable leadership to achieve their shared purpose. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com. Dot au. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left political and cultural podcast that dives into the progressive issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. On this week's episode, we're going north to Queensland to talk to a good friend of mine, Jackie Trad, who is the state Labor member for South Brisbane and she is in a bit of a dogfight right now with uh, less than two weeks Till election day, folks are voting right now. Uh, they're predicting huge turnouts in uh, pre-poll and postal. So that basically every day is election day for, for Jackie and for Labor. So Jackie's coming on today to talk basically a bit about her life, how she first got involved in politics, um, and talk a bit about the Queensland election. Uh, today is Tuesday in Melbourne. Um, so normally we record our episodes uh, late in the week and punch one up, but we've got two episodes this week. So Jackie, today on Tuesday, we're recording another one on Thursday morning with Ross morales Riquetto, who's the co-founder of Run for Something, which is an organization in the United States that is geared towards finding young people that want to put up their hand and run for public office in the United States um, in all the down ballot races um, progressors who want to make change and Ross um, will be coming on the show on Thursday to talk about all the work that they're doing since 2016 which will be really exciting so two episodes this week uh, but starting with uh, Jackie Trad today uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher and uh, Amazon and if you're an Apple Podcast user please leave us a rating and give us a review uh, that always helps bump up our um it appears when you search and that helps the popularity or something of the podcast. And that's what we want. We want more listeners because um, that's sort of the end game, I think, for podcasts in a num numeric sense. Anyway, uh, don't forget to follow Socially Democratic on uh, the Dunn Street socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. And let's get today's episode. <laughs> Okay, we're taping this one on a Tuesday morning in uh, s slowly getting out of lockdown Melbourne, um, slowly but surely. Um, and we're actually doing two episodes this week and this is the first one and I'm really excited about today's guest, um, Jackie Trad, the member for South Brisbane and uh, we're heading into a, another dogfight of an election in a couple of weeks' time. Welcome to Socially Democratic. Hi, Stephen, and hi to all your listeners. It's great to be here. Um, we're going to talk about the obviously pre poll has begun. Um, so I said essentially it's kind of election day every day for you now. And we will talk about the election in a moment. But I actually wanted to talk a bit more about you um, and sure. not wanting to turn this into an ABC Australian story kind of episode. But, um, you know, let's find out a bit more about yourself and um, your motivations and what led you to get into politics, um, first of all. So starting with your childhood, talk, talk to me about that. Um, what did your parents do for a job? What was your childhood like? Did you grow up in? Did you actually grow up in South Brisbane? Yeah, um, born and raised in South Brisbane. Um, our childhood was one that I think many second generation migrants could identify with. So there was lots of love. Um, there was lots of um, culture. There was um, different a different language spoken at home, but it was also hard. I mean, mum and dad ran a small business, so we were a family small business, um, small business family, I should say, and so there were big expectations on us to contribute, contribute in the business and contribute at home. There were five of us, so it wasn't um, like the childhood my kids have experienced or uh, many others in this modern age. Um, there were huge responsibilities from a very early age. Um, you said that your um, second generation migrant, where did your family migrate from? So my family, my parents came from Lebanon. Um, 
interestingly enough, my um, grandfather came out in the 1950s, early 1950s, and it was always his intention to um, reunify the family here in Australia after he had um, settled and saved up enough money. When he left for Australia, my father was only eight um, and still attending a primary school in Lebanon. And unfortunately, his um, attempts to um, reunify the family failed repetitively and it was you know more than 10 years almost 12 years before um, the rest of the family my grandmother and seven children uh, came out from Lebanon so dad was the uh, most um, senior male in the family and there were expectations on him to leave school at that age and to work and he did he worked hard uh, but the family is in Lebanon essentially grew up in in abject poverty. I understand why. I mean, we've got certainly here in Melbourne and all across Australia, we've got a really strong Lebanese community. And I've always assumed that the larger part of that migration took place um, because of the fallout of the Civil War in the late 70s and early 80s. What was bringing uh, Lebanese migrants out to Australia in the 1950s? Well, I think there were a number of factors. The post-World War II um, struggles of uh, Europe and um, <clears throat> this was the Middle East, Lebanon was in the Middle East, and also the establishment of the State of Israel as well. So there were a whole range of uh, geopolitical specific uh, issues going on at the time. Um, there were food shortages, um, you know, my grandfather came from a very small village in Lebanon, uh, so there was, uh, there was no prospect of a better life there. They were uh, farmers, so he had, a, he had a farm, he worked that farm, uh, but in terms of job, jobs and opportunities and education, uh, there was nothing happening in the community that he was growing up in, uh, so he he came to Australia and there had been a number of uh, people from the village, the same village who'd come out to Australia as well. Why did this choose Brisbane? <laughs> it's it's very interesting. I, um, I always was told that Sydney was just too busy. Um, and I think that it, it, it's true that Jidul um, Neji, uh, so my grandfather's name is Neji, um, and my brother's name is Nati, um, that he grew up in a very small village. And the, um, I guess the bigness and the busyness of Sydney and Melbourne was not something that he um, he enjoyed. So he came to, um, to Brisbane, which was still oh, like a hundred times bigger than anything he'd experienced in Lebanon. Um, and it was much more to his style. He also, he also had friends who were here from Lebanon. Um, it's interesting just to hear you talking about your childhood and uh, you had working parents. Have you heard the expression about, because you and I are both Generation X, um, mm -hmm. that we've been described as the latchkey generation. Have you heard that term? I have, yes. I hadn't until a couple of weeks ago. It blew my mind. <laughs> um, someone <laughs> sent me a sort of a, an article talking about the, it was specifically talking about Generation X and how the, you know, their par our parents are either um, boomers um, or the silent generation, but the majority are uh, our parents of the silent generation. My, <coughs> my parents are silent generation. Yeah. Um, but this sort of, we, we were the first generation that had, for the listeners out there that don't know what I'm talking about, um, had uh, first generation that had working parents. And so for, therefore we were known as the latchkey generation because there was a latchkey to, to let us in the house after <laughs> school, which I find funny because even though my mum mum was... Uh, not a working parent. Um, I mean, she worked for dad, but, you know, she was working at home. Mum was, you know, busy running around getting shopping and stuff. So I would be constantly coming home and mum would be out doing things. But I didn't have a latch key. I had to climb through the window on the second story of our property. <laughs> so I had to jump on the garage roof and then scale this kind of, you know, this Batman operation on ledges to then climb through. So I don't think I was necessarily a latch key, just a sort of a window breaker kind of generation. <laughs> Um, but uh, describe your experiences growing up as a jet, as a fellow Gen Xer. Uh, we are the forgotten generation, I think, because there's this big shit fight going on right now between millennials and boomers, and no one even has no one's even talking about us anymore. You mentioned who NXS is, and they don't even know what you're talking about. So I just want to get your thoughts about growing up as a Gen Xer in Brisbane in the 1980s. Um, look, tell me about it. Like <laughs> in excess, they were 
I mean, it was one of the first concerts I ever went to and they, you know, totally, you know, I was totally in love with them. So I've recently bought some in excess vinyl and introduced my children to, my teenage children to them. Um, so I think, um, you know, growing up as Generation X, um, the, the latchkey kids, uh, you know, there was, we of course came home, um, I recall coming home without mum and dad being there. They were busy running the shop. Uh, we had a lovely neighbour, Robbie, who lived across the road, um, and she would come over and occasionally check on us and make sure no one was dead or we hadn't killed my little brother or anything like that. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, we got up in the morning. Uh, mum and dad had already left for work. They had to get to the markets and buy produce, and uh, we had to get ourselves ready for school. And, of course, myself and my... Um, older sister Marilyn, we had responsibilities in terms of managing all that. Um, it was, um, you know, it was, I guess, it was what it was. I didn't know anything different. And mm. it, as a kid, you just, you, you do uh, what you have to do. Um, and I was so uh, privileged, I think. Uh, my parents were incredibly hard workers. They taught me the ethic of hard work. They taught me what it means to be part of a community and to give. Um, and I guess uh, not knowing any different, I, um, you know, I, I thrived in that environment. Of course, you know, when I got a little bit older and would go over to friends' place for sleepovers and stuff like that, it, I was I was introduced to, you know, a different family structure, you know, where mums didn't work so much. And, um, yeah, I guess it was different, but I wouldn't swap it for anything. You uh, returned to your ancestral homeland in Lebanon uh, at some point in your childhood. <laughs> Tell us about that. How did that come about and what was that experience like? Well, this happened in 1979. So the Civil War in Lebanon went from 1975 to 1985. So 1979 is slap bang in the middle of the Civil War. Um, I guess as a seven-year-old at the time, um, you know, you're old enough to really have memories ingrained on your brain, but you're not mature enough at the time to actually make sense of a lot of stuff that was happening. Mm. Um, so I look back at that time and I really, um, it, it's, it's very emotive for me. Um, I think it was very emotive for my parents. I think a large part of why we went was because um, because Dad had grown up in such poverty in Lebanon uh, and had worked for essentially nothing uh, from the age of eight. Um, I, I think having come to Brisbane and been a success, carved out a business, um, had five kids, you know, owned his own house, like was making it in this new country. I think for him it was very much about coming full circle and actually uh, for him and for my mum actually making um, making it known and making him feel uh, like he was not only a success here in Australia but uh, back in his homeland, in his birthland, um, that that was recognised as well. We stayed there for about a year. I do think that um, there was a very... Um, keen desire for mum and dad to think about repatriation to Lebanon, which is bizarre in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, but we were there for a year. We went to school. Um, you know, dad started making plans to uh, repair the house that was the family home. So there was, you know, there were. it, it wasn't just a holiday and it was never a sense of a holiday for me. Um, it was about, you know, carving out a way in a new place and perhaps if we weren't to repatriate there, could we come back on a regular basis? But Lebanon was broken. Like the, the Syrians occupied the land. Um, there were checkpoints in so many places. It was um, it was so scary to go through checkpoints and have all of us get out of the car and to have luggage taken out of the boot and strewn all over the dirty road and inspected and, you know, not just once, but quite often and it would leave my mother in tears and we were all, I mean, I don't know how you um, make sense of that as a child, but that was what the country was in the middle of and um, it was very scary. 
Yeah, I mean, you're, you're reasonably young then, but what kind of lasting impression did it have on you? Were there moments sort of later when you dawn on that and go, Jesus Christ, what the hell was going on there? Like having gone through that experience. I just want to come back home. Mm. I just want to come back to Australia. I didn't want to be in a land where, you know, there were, you know, men and sometimes kids walking around with um, with semi-automatics. I didn't, I didn't want to feel the... Um, I guess the collective anxiety of um, you know of of the people who were you know trying to survive in a land where violence could erupt at any moment and did. Mm. Um, I guess I did not feel safe, and it really did illustrate or uh, articulate for me in a very emotional way the safety and security of Australia, and that's something that I think. You know, we we do take for granted. We we don't actually understand the violence and the um, that's inherent in some in some countries in some lands because of legacy and historical um, decisions. So, what brought you guys back? Who was the decider? In, oh. the, in your mum or your dad? I'm pretty sure it was my mum. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was my mum, and I think that. Um, you know, it just got to the point where the violence, um, the military presence, the foreign occupation, that was all so um, in your face. Um, and it was, you know, I, I think that the cumulative impact on that as a family unit was enough. And we made the decision to come home. And I was very happy. <laughs> you um, attended... Uh you uh, obviously being Maronite Catholic uh, attended um, is it St Joseph's Primary? Yeah, and, at Kangaroo Point. At yeah. Kangaroo Point and uh, yeah. Lords Hill College. I think they're good Samaritans from memory. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, how important was uh, faith and tradition in the Trad household growing up? It was and still is very important. Um, it is very much our tradition to. Um, celebrate, mark, commemorate um, moments, occasions, anniversaries through religious Maronite ceremonies um, and then gather as a family unit or as a community. So um, there's there's not many events where you don't, the church isn't involved in uh, what you do growing up. So it's it's very important. It's, um, you know, I was recently at Mass 8.30 on a Sunday morning um, to mark the 25th anniversary of my father's death. And, um, you know, it was, um, it, it for me growing up, church was, you know, it was a bit of a double-edged sword. But as I sat there um, in the church and, you know, my kids were there and most of it's in Aramaic and no one can understand it and there's a lot of frankincense being uh, burned. Uh I actually, it was so peaceful and um, meditative, I guess, and I felt like, you know, as a society, we, we race around trying to find, you know, the best app for mindfulness or for to create a bit of headspace and stuff. And um, I had forgotten, I guess, that church does provide that sort of opportunity to stop and reflect. And um, you might not be following all the words, you you might not understand what's going on, but there is just a, there's a nice uh, meditative quality about going to church and ritual. You're saying you might not be able to follow the words. It doesn't help when they change the order of the mass as well for some particular reason. (laughs) I don't know why they did that. That drives, it still drives me insane to this day because I still don't remember it in perfect order. After having said it, like wrote learned for, you know, know. since a child. Um, and the cliche, actually, no. My second question to that is then, uh, growing up in a in a Catholic family or in a, a family of faith, so it's applied to anyone, but where you've got parents who have sort of said, "Look, while you're living under this roof, you're going to go to mass, or you're going to go to temple, or you." Yeah. You know. um, but then once you go off and do your own thing, it's up. It's completely up to you. Um, I'm assuming that's kind of the same rules that were applied to um, you and your siblings as well. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. How did you manage to keep your faith after that? That's always an interesting thing, I think, for any young person. Um, I guess it's, for me, um, it's not about the institution or the attendance. 
it's about the cultural connection. And for me, uh, faith is more about spirituality than it is about religion. And um, I have a deep respect for the importance that the Maronite church and the Maronite faith plays in my mother's life. Um, and uh, I, you know, I won't disrespect that. It's, in, it's so important for her and it's, and it's a way of us to be culturally connected. Uh, it's an organised way for us to be culturally connected and not just um, connected as a family. Um, but for me, I think it is about uh, connection to, um, I guess, spirituality and understanding that uh, this life I have is, uh, is very precious, but it's connected to a whole... Uh, a, a larger, um, a larger universe of understanding and energy, and I'm just one person in that. Your uh, alma mater is Griffith University. Mm. Um, was go attending university a big deal? Was it a natural thing that was just going to happen? Talk us through the thought process of going to uh, to university for you. No, university was not an automatic thing in my family. I guess, you know, we were um, a small business family. My brother runs his own small business. Um, uh, so, you know, I was the first one from my whole extended family. There were about, um, there were lots of us cousins, lots. There was, you know, seven kids and, you know, um, people had five, four, um, seven kids. So there was a lot of us cousins. Mm. Uh, so I was the first one from my first cousins to go to university. And uh, my grandmother, uh, who was still alive at the time, didn't understand it. My father, <laughs> uh, look, he, he sort of got it, but he couldn't explain it to her. And I remember um, I, I must have been at the end of the first year or beginning of second year university. And we were all gathered at my grandmother's place. And uh, I was still very young, I think just 20 or something. And... Um, she asked me what I was doing and I told her I was going to university and she said, well, what's this university? All in Arabic. What's this university? And I tried to explain it to her and she just got so frustrated. <laughs> and she said, you need to throw this away. Don't stop throwing away your life. You're spoiling your life. No one wants to marry you. You're too old now. So it was just, a, you know, it was a very, it, it was a very difficult thing to explain um, to people. And it, you know, and there are some who are still in that mindset, but um, I'm so glad it did. I mean, the life opportunities that I've been able to, you know, um, uh, choose have just been because, you know, I went to university and you know, I got myself educated. And I think that all kids need to get themselves educated, whether it's in higher education or whether it's in, you know, trades and skills. And it, it is important um, it's important for life opportunities. Uh, did the political uh, socialisation of Jackie Trad begin at university or did it start before then, do you think? I think it was um, honed at university. I think my Maronite upbringing, very conservative, very patriarchal, very fixed views on the role of women in society and family. I also think looking back, you know, the the exposure to the civil war in Lebanon and a sense of how precious peace is, um, how precious it is to uh, the, the basic and universal humanity of people, uh, I think that really seeded it for me. And then, but absolutely, my feminism was born out of, uh, I guess, resistance to my conservative patriarchal upbringing. And then when I went to university, I, I met great people who were feminists, um, who cared about things that young people cared about, the price of higher education, you know, um, youth wages, you know, um, all of that stuff that absolutely honed for me uh, my politics in a way that um, that I could, that matched my values. Where are you on the idea of a instituting a gap year for people who have come out of high school before they go into university. Because I just think about when I first attended university as an 18-year-old from country Victoria, I was out of my depth and I did not have a lot of 
you know, life experiences. Um, and going into, like, I think the first year at uni, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I was living on, co- I was living on campus uh, at college. So I'm surrounded by hundreds of other country kids as well. So really I'm kind of in a sort of an embassy of rural, you know, teenagers. Um, and I just don't think that, I, th- I think, I feel like, because I, I, I end up not finishing my degree because I got sucked into student politics and um, labour politics and the labour movement. And it's only when I went back years later as a mature age student and I became, yes, that mature age student in class who handed in all their essays on time and, you know, went to all the tutes and knew all the answers, to, did all the readings. I was that guy. Um, it was such a different experience, university education. It was such a gift. Like I really, the second time around, just to finish off my degree, I really enjoyed my classes. I got a lot out of it. Whereas the first time around, um, it felt like I was on a game of It's a Knockout or something. Remember that really bad show that was set in Queensland? Mm-hmm. And got, yeah, yeah. I felt like I was on that. I was just constantly like on a running water wheel and I had to go fill up a bucket or something. I just, just, I just everything was happening and I just, I wasn't taking it all in. Um, and I feel like if I had a couple of years just out there in the real world, just to kind of get a bit of sense of perspective before I go in there and then go and get a tertiary education, which is, you know, such an important next step. I'm not asking for Labor Party policy here to change it, <laughs> but I just want to get your thoughts on that. If you reflect on your time as a young, as a young woman going into university as well, what was your... I um, Well, I had a gap year. And look, I think just to answer your question up front, I don't think we should institute or mandate anything because we're all different. We all have different fears and different motivations. And I think that um, we need to be able to have a system that uh, can respond to those idiosyncratic differences we all have. Um, for me, I I was I got into uni you know, from high school, but I was scared. I didn't know what that meant, and I did know what it meant to work and work hard. And so I, I, you know, got a, um, you know, I did a basic training course um, in hospitality and civil service. And I worked in the hospitality sector for a year, but I was on really low wages and I was working really long hours and I wasn't getting paid very much and being bossed around by a lot of people and eventually took on a whole lot of responsibility and nothing changed in terms of my pay packet. And I just decided this is not, I don't want 40 years of this. Mm. I, I want to do something else. I want to use my brain. Like I can, I can use my, you know, you know, I can work in a in hospitality and small business, and lots of people do. And you know, I don't think we we value that so much as a career. There's not enough progression. But I couldn't see a way for me to want to do it for 40 years. Not for me. So that really did motivate me to go to university and um, yeah, take that leap, that big leap. But I had to overcome a lot of fear to do that. How did you first make the connection that getting involved in um, the labour movement or specifically the political wing, where did that where did that entry point happen, and why why did that why why did you pick the Labor Party as saying okay that's somewhere I think I can actually do good things? Well, I so it's just so was not on my radar at all. Um, so, but in in some of the classes that I was doing, I was enrolled in education at the time. I wanted to be a teacher. Um, well, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. And that, that goes back to your point. Like, what are you doing in your first year? You know, you're 18, 19. And, uh, and the other thing for me is I graduated school a year younger than my cohort. Um, but um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was sort of just turned, I just turned 18 at the time. And, um, you know, I met some fantastic people, including a woman called Sue, who uh, came from an Italian background. So, you know, looking around at the sea of faces in my class, um, you know, she she was another wog chick and I naturally gravitated towards her. She was a little bit older than me and had a bit more confidence about um, her engagement in the class and her position and stuff. And she just said a lot of things that I agreed with and we became really good friends and um, she suggested actually that I go to a meeting of the Labor Club um, on campus, which I did. And, you know, there was 
great people and we had great discussions and it sort of snowballed from there. But I didn't actually join the party for a while and it wasn't until I then, you know, I don't know how it happened, but I, I went to an event and there were all of these, you know, feisty feminists in the Labor Party who were just um, really opinionated about a whole range of things, uh, like the representation of women, how we get more women elected into Parliament, um, you know, abortion law reform, a whole range of things that I absolutely agreed with. Um, and and so I just went, this is the place for me. Mm. This is, I do want to, I do want to join these people and this movement because not only do they say things that I agree with and we have similar values, but they're actually doing something about it. They're actually doing something about it. And yeah, I've never looked back. Do you find that is your experience as um, a, a woman in the party, when you go into a room, as you've just described before, that's full of feminists, is this, is there a moment of like, oh my God, I found my people. Like I've been searching for, maybe I couldn't put a finger on that, what experience I was looking for, but oh, this feels right. Like this makes sense to me. Is that, is that kind of what it was like? Because I, I yeah, yeah, no, totally. It does. I mean, <laughs> you sort of you sort of don't want to say anything to to get chewed up and spat out either. You know, <laughs> you're a young person, and you know your your views are, um, you know, you might have very strong views about things, but um, being able to articulate it in a way. But look, I um, these women, you know. Anne Warner, um, Anna Bly, Norma Jones, Jenny, like all of these amazing women who um, would get together regularly and talk about things and provide provided a level of sophisticated uh, information around what was happening in the world, um, which you wouldn't get, you know, um, necessarily from media these days. But um, it was so enlightening and I, I just, yes, I, I felt like I had found my people. So I guess my question then is, are we doing enough in that space in the party to provide those, like, were you lucky that you just happened to, that that, that, that space was created in Queensland Labor for you to walk into? Do we do enough of that from an institutional, organisational standpoint? No, you? we don't, Stephen. I don't think we do. I don't think we, I don't think we mentor enough. I don't think we um, explain the complexities of, uh, not just politics, but governing. You know, it's really easy for our opponents to come out and to um, to run campaigns or to say things because they work on limited information, limited facts, or no facts at all. Mm. Um, and it's really, I think, important for young people to understand that. that well, for all of us to understand. I, I think I'm being a bit patronising here, but I think it's important that. People understand that um, it, the it, managing for change or doing or working for change is not as easy as putting together a policy. It's not as easy as articulating uh, a position or your values, as important as that is. And I'm not dismissing that. But we come from a tradition within the Labor Party where change has always been contested and it has always um, brought with it huge vested interests that have funded conservative attacks around the things that we do. Mm. Uh, superannuation, um, you know, native title. Uh, you look at any anything that the Labor Party has fought to change and change for the better, universal health care. Uh, there has been a cashed up by vested interests, conservative campaign against us, and now on the left side, we have the Greens political party uh, that are actively stopping good progress, good change. And so here's the Labor Party trying to do this, the centre-left sensible um, change that's necessary for our democracy. And it's being torn apart at both ends. And we saw that in the federal election. We absolutely saw that in the federal election between Clive Palmer's ads and Bob Brown's convoy to Claremont, they both executed the same strategy. They both executed the same strategy and the end result is Scott Morrison 
climate sceptic government, no action on climate change. Um, and that's what both both sides of the political spectrum did. And we need to actually explain that to young people who are passionate about change, who are passionate about, you know, getting in there and tackling the, the most complex and challenging of issues like climate change. And unless we do explain to them how we actually navigate all of that, um, then it's going to be a really hard road for uh, people who believe in change and social democratic change, people who believe that we have an obligation uh, to do more on the front of climate change. You know, it's it's going to be hard. We're just going to be politicking the whole time and not progressing things. Interesting uh, podcast without plugging previous episodes of Social Democratic, but a couple of weeks ago um, I handed the microphone over to three uh, women who have put their hand up to run in the local government elections down here mm. in Victoria. And I said, you guys just just do the show um, and talk about what it's like to run. Um, two of, of the three have never put their hand up in, for public office before. Um, Wessa Chow had run in a federal election, I think, before in a safe liberal seat. Um, and it was just interesting listening to their reflections on the barriers that existed for them both um, uh, as women as a common denominator that united the three of them but also then the diversity that they brought to it um, age geography um, ethnicity um, and the barriers that were put up for them and the things that they had to consider and weigh up in order to run for public office and the flip side um, one of the i think it was um, amy um, who's running in the in sort of um, peri-urban part of Melbourne, s- said that... Uh, oh, no, wait, it was, it was Minnie, sorry, apologies. Um, she said that she'd been talking to a friend of hers, a Labor friend of hers, and she said like, for like three or four months she'd been weighing up whether she wanted to run and going through all the pros and cons. And then eventually she said, you know what, I've decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to run for public office. So she, she's put her hand up. Then her friend that she was um, confiding in, a bloke, then decided two days later, you know what, you're right, I'll do it too. And so he ran as well. And she's like, my God, I had to go through all this process to think about, you know, whether I wanted to run. And this other guy just goes, oh, yeah, I'll run, you know. Um, Speaking about your own, um, reflecting on your own journey in seeking public office and thinking about those women today, how do we make it easier for particularly young people? Because I, I do believe there are thousands of young people that, could be scooped up by the Labor Party um, and brought them into our broader movement, a large broad church, and take their energy and their resources um, and their focus into organising our party to be bigger, stronger and more representative of the community. But right now I don't think they know how to do that. Like, and once they do get in, I don't think they know how the roadmap works. It can be kind of confusing and a little bit intimidating as well. Um, what can we do to make that easier for people like... Amy and Wessa and, and, and Minnie that were on the other week? Mm. I think um, this, is a, this is a very interesting question. I um, Like I've got teenage boys and they listen to podcasts. Um, I was talking to a young guy uh, last night actually uh, at an event and um, and he was saying that, you know, in terms of politics, like he doesn't, he doesn't get it, but what he does do, he and all of his mates and his girlfriends, male friends and stuff, they all tune into things like Friendly Geordies, for example, mm. and try and actually understand the world through, you know, humour, I guess. And uh, I think that what we have is um, a system. I think our politics is, in terms of our political system, we have the commentariat talking to politicians who are talking to the commentariat and I just feel like young people uh, feel like they're excluded from that conversation. I think it's about the quality of the dialogue we have with them, not at them. Um, And I think it's about us understanding that that us us who are interested, who are passionate about social democratic change um, understanding the different mediums for communicating. You know, it's not just about platforms. It's also about the the type and style that we communicate with them on. And look, you know, um, the last time I feel like, and I'm happy to be um, 
you know, corrected on this matter. But the last time I felt like there was this huge, big youth surge in terms of Labor Party electoral politics was when, you know, Kevin Rudd was building up his campaign momentum leading into the 2007 election. And, you know, there's a whole range of things that have happened since then, like the handball game. Like th There are things that people, that he has done that young people say, well, it sort of speaks to us in a way. Mm. Um, and I think we haven't done enough to actually understand what that is and to be able to, you know, not replicate it per se, but take the learnings and be able to imbue those learning into the way that we engage with younger people. I mean, I, I think the Greens political party, um, they talk to younger people um, in a way that's really, uh, you know, dogmatic and self-righteous and it doesn't actually give them all the information about how complex our community and our economy is. You know, there's just overwhelming outrage as opposed to how do we work for outcomes? Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, we can be as outraged as we like, um, but if we're not moving the dial on things, then it, you know, we just sit in our wage and that's it. Is it too much to ask of our national leaders or even at a state level, our state leaders um, to be the, the beacon of hope and to be that clarion call that brings young people in? Because I'm thinking about last week we had um, Katie Parsons on who um, got into politics through organising for Obama in 2008. And if you listen to a lot of Ameri progressive Americans, American, uh, you know, people on the left, you took, it seems to be that it was either Robert Kennedy or Barack Obama are the two major leaders that drew in a generation of young people mm -hmm. to get involved in politics. And in Australia, I sort of think about that and I think, well, who are ours? And I think obviously Whitlam stands out. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I can actually see a, a It's Time poster in the background of your office there. Whitlam is clearly one. Hawk, I think. I'm, I'm, I was going to say I'm too young. I was definitely too young for um, for Whitlam. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I see a generation of people that did get involved because of Bob. But I, I think that, that I think it's there. Um, and then I've, the Kevin 07 campaign you just mentioned is probably the last time I feel like there was this kind of – it, it mm -hmm. got viral, you know, beyond mm -hmm. just um, the work of the branches and stuff that – I remember being at a – I was living in Adelaide at the time and I had, remember those Kevin 07 flags that you could attach to your windscreen of your car? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's how much cr crap we were punching out during that campaign. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're hitting sort of peak um, popularity when you just can shit out merch and just people, you know, take it. So we're at the traffic lights um, on Main North Road in Adelaide at a red light and a car pulls up beside us. Funnily enough, <laughs> they were Scottish, they were Glaswegians. <laughs> And um, I had the flag hanging out the car window. And they went down the window and the dad says, um, love your flag, pal. <laughs> and, I was, and he's got kids in the back, the whole car full of kids. And uh, I said, do you want it? And he said, oh, that'd be brilliant. And I ripped it off and given it to him and he's given it to the kids. The back of the car just erupts. Yeah, like, this is the, great, the greatest moment of their lives. It's a freaking, <laughs> you know, it's a flag, right? And at, I had that moment to myself and I went, wow, this is going beyond, like I've not seen enthusiasm for a politi political party or indeed a leader in my lifetime. I, you know, when Hawke was elected, I was eight, too young to sort of recognise mm. that. I don't think we've had that since then. And I, but also, yeah. so my, my original question was, is it too much to ask our leaders to be that? Like Jacinda Ardern over across the ditch clearly mm. is that leader as well, going by the results mm. of um, the weekend. Um, yeah, is, is, are we asking too much of our leaders? Are we asking too much of Elbow or previously previous leaders? Do we need to actually find our enthusiasm at a local level on the things that motivate us and organise around that as opposed to being inspired by one particular person? Mm. I, think, I think it's so challenging, isn't it? Because, um, you know, this generation, millennials, have grown up in a brand culture, right? So uh, I think leadership is critical and important, um, but it's also about the uh, the brand that they follow. And it's almost like there's this brand associated with political parties that speaks to specific demographics. 
I think that's wrong and I think we need to bust through that. I think that's just lazy thinking. Uh, but how do we do it? And I think this is a really critical question. I do think leadership is, is important. I do think um, talking to young people and understanding that they have they have significant concerns about the future. I had con significant concerns about the future when I was young, you know. Um, uh, so being able to talk to them about the future and where you're leading the state or the country um, in terms of their future is critical and important. It's almost like, um, you know, we are in our middle age or we're old and we're happy, like we're going through the... We have... We've accumulated our assets. Uh, we've got our education. You know, we've 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 got our job. Like we've got all of these things in place. But for them, um, what they see is, you know, very different, a very different economy and very different workplaces than the ones that their parents uh, went into. And I don't think we're actually talking to them about that real live anxiety and fear. And that's what we need to do. And we need to we need to talk about the future and the future is critical and important. And that's what Kevin did, right? Kevin was talking about a future post Howard. And people, you know, I think Howard had disappointed so many people with his arrogant dismissal of so many things, so many things, you know, um, the apology to the stolen generation, um, you know, any notion of treaty, climate change, everything. Um, he was suffocating any sort of creative thinking about the future. Mm. And he was excluding young people from that. And Kevin sort of busted it open and said, no, nah, you know, mm. uh, we care about these things and we care about young people being part of that future design. Speaking about the future, the future's on the ballot uh, in Queensland at the moment. Um, and let's turn mm. our attention to the election. Um it's actually difficult. To, one thing I've just realised in the last couple of weeks, and someone pointed this out to me um, recently who is in Sydney, had called me up and said, Stephen, how is it going down there? Because it's really hard for us to get a sense of what's going on in Melbourne because all of our news is out of Sydney and it's very Sydney biased. Um, and then he made the follow-up point going, I don't even know what's going on really in Queensland with the election <laughs> because of the same reason. So before this particular episode, I had been sort of trawling through... Um, you know, the news coverage to get a handle on the election. Um, and I'm my first question to you is, is this a ballot about or is this a referendum on who is best to handle COVID or are there policy debates cutting through that are important to the electorate? How, how have you sort of seen this campaign play out? I am um, from my perspective and let's, be clear, I have a um, drawn perspective or a prejudicial view because, you know, I'm in the fight and for me, I sort of um, am hypersensitive to it and it's really interesting to, to talk to people who aren't, mm. um, you know, uh, who have much more of a helicopter or a peripheral sort of as, uh, position or perspective on it all. Uh, I think people are... Someone said to me, you know, this election is really boring. And it was at the time that Trump, Trump got diagnosed with coronavirus. And I said, well, you know, what is actually going to make Queensland state politics interesting after Donald Trump has coronavirus? He has a, you know, go at Meghan Markle. Victoria's in lockdown. You know, the Premier of Victoria is getting hell long interviews every day. You know, UK is diagnosing 15,000 new cases every week. Like, Tell me, what is going to bust through all of that, you know, yeah. incredible colour and movement? And, you know, and so so I think it's been hard for people to really focus in on the policy debates. But there has been great policies and plans put forward by the Labor government, you know, building an economic plan around, you know, manufacturing jobs, infrastructure, you know, health and education jobs, community sector jobs, um, renewable energy, fantastic investments in renewable, renewable energy going forward. But I think all of this is overshadowed by COVID. Mm. And I think we've all seen how quickly things can deteriorate in terms of community transmission. 
And so a lot of people are going to the ballot box and the people I've spoken to at the ballot box uh, today, at the pre-poll today, are talking about, um, you know, the health, the global health pandemic, how we manage things going forward, the impact it's had on our economy and how we can make sure that, you know, workers, or we've still got jobs being created, uh, that those who can't get a job because there's only one job for every seven unemployed people, how do we get them supported? How do we make sure that support doesn't get withdrawn too quickly by the federal government? And how do we make sure that small businesses keep operating? I mean, they've borne the brunt of such significant economic um, impacts uh, that it's really important for us to, to be able to keep them afloat. Here in Queensland, they employ 44% of all private sector employees. So it's really important that small business survives at the other end of this. Is the Has or was the experience of uh, dealing with the pandemic in Queensland uh, variable by region. So did people's experience of it in Brisbane be a sharp dif uh, uh, d difference to those up in sort of far north Queensland? Or No, I think people in, in north Queensland wanted the, um, the border moved north to exclude <laughs> everyone from the southeast coming up. Because we had more cases, mm. um, you know, than they they had. So look, I, I I think there's been overwhelming support for the premier's decision around the borders. Um, you, you know, people are uh, talking to me about how successful that's been, um, but also what is the way forward, um, and that's that's a really important conversation to have with people. Um, but I think in terms of North Queensland, uh, Central Queensland, South East Queensland, you know, everyone has been understanding that this, the most effective way to deal with this is through the most simplest instructions and public health warnings. And that's what Queensland has done. And it has been incredibly successful. I understand the Queensland government has banned dancing at weddings. Are there any other subplots from Footloose that you're going to impose on Queenslanders? Well, Stephen, my um, my eldest son has actually formed a band, and they haven't been able to name the band yet. And they can't reach a consensus on it. And um, he was That's a uh, bad invited. Start. Sorry. That's a very bad start to a band. It's a very bad start, but they sound great. Right? They're, going to, they're going to break up um, after this. <laughs> But they were asked to do three songs at the formal. I'm not sure it actually eventuated because a whole range of other reasons. But um, Leo was talking to me about, you know, the, the three songs and he was actually going to play Footloose as an Love ironic it. contribution Love it. Love <laughs> it. to the event. Um, but, uh, look, I, I spoke to someone this morning. We go to the same gym and he got married recently and um, he said it was, it was great. They had, you know, COVID-safe plan. They were, you know... They all had fun anyway. So. Good. Very good. Very good. Um, the election obviously is on October 31. Am I yep. right about that? Yes. Uh, half a million Queenslanders have applied for postal votes. Is that right? Yeah. Huge amount. Uh, my early research, I made a prediction that I thought that at least 40% um, would early vote. But I read something yesterday that they were predicting up to 70%. Is that right? That's a yeah. huge number. So 100,000 people voted at pre-poll yesterday. That was the first day of wow. voting. So 100,000 people right across the state. Um, and that's only going to increase. So, yes, um, I think they've done some assessment. And, you know, if it if it continues to, um, you know, be that 100,000 or 200,000 people a day turn out to pre-poll, you know, 70% of the electorate would have voted by election day. And it just, I, I've been advocating for this for a while. We need to stop calling it election day. The minute early voting starts, we should just call it election fortnight or election week or whatever the time yeah. period is. Just to, And it, it encourage people to say, look, if you want to get in early, do that, right? Yeah. And yeah. particularly yeah. because of COVID, that's something that's really driven these numbers up, which yeah. then makes a strategic question for the party to consider about their, you know, front-loading their policy announcements in kind of yeah. getting all your stuff out before people start voting because... You know, no one's got to announce a policy on Sunday, the Sunday after election. So why, or even midway through the day of election day on the Saturday, traditionally on the Saturday. So why, 
we just start dropping announcements whilst people are voting. Uh, have you guys got most of your stuff out? Are you happy with the, the sort of the argument you've made to the electorate about why you guys deserve another four more years? Absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, the, um, the uh, important stuff that we've been talking about, not just during the election proper period, but well before that, I mean, when COVID was first a very real um, threat uh, to Queenslanders and their their health, as well as our economy, um, we moved quite swiftly for economic support packages and for a boost in public health funding. Um, so all of that was locked and loaded. What we have been doing now is refining and articulating to the electorate the way forward in terms of economic stability and recovery. And that's what people are talking to me about more than anything else. Um, they're deeply interested in you know, where the jobs are going to come from. People know in, instinctively, intuitively, that JobKeeper can't um, go on uh, infinitum. Um, and they want to know what the state's plan is. They want to know what the federal government's plan is. There's a real sense that the worst is yet to come. Well, the flip side of that is the Tories have not released their policy costings um, and they said they're going to do it towards the end of the campaign. Surely that's a norm that needs to change for the sake of transparency in our democracy, that, that, that we have to ask our major political parties to release how they're going to pay for their announcements before people start voting. No, totally. And I think we also, well, we also need to um, ask those parties that could potentially form the crossbench in a minority government to also release their costings. I mean, um, you know, we've got a political party that's promising free everything. Um, and I'm just not sure how they propose to pay for it. Uh, I do think in terms of the LNP, there is a very, very um, important need for them to come clean with their costings. Uh, you know, I was first elected into parliament with, when Campbell Newman won in a landslide. Um, and there were a lot of promises and they were very scant on detail around paying for them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they gave a commitment to the people of Queensland that the public servants have nothing to feel from a Newman government. They turned around and they sacked tens of thousands of public servants in order to pay for their election commitments. So let's be really clear, they have form on this and they have made uh, some key, uh, they have articulated some key economic principles that if they actually um, implemented them at this particular point in time, we would actually see three times as many public servants sacked, we'd see significant withdrawal of funding from the community sector um, from health and education. Uh, I mean, I think there's a very, very big responsibility on the LNP to release their costings and release them on them. Last question, because I don't want to um, keep you from um, pre-poll. Um, how, yeah. how are you feeling about your uh, campaign in, in South Brisbane? You're obviously in a marginal seat and in a, you had a really competitive campaign last time around up against the, the Greens political party. How are you faring in 2020? So Stephen, look, in terms of my seat, I've, um, I, I don't think I've ever had just a normal election. Like I was around when, you know, there was, you know, uh, I don't know, one of the mill elections, I suppose. You know, my first election was the, the Newman landslide. I had a by-election. It was really bloody tough, I have to say. Um, and then followed by... Uh, another Campbell Newman election <laughs> where he got booted and Labor made a minority government, formed a minority government. Then last election, it was all about, you know, the Carmichael mine. And so, you know, there was so many, you know, people in the seat of South Brisbane, um, you know, working very hard to unseat me. Uh, and then this election, which uh, the coronavirus election. So uh, every single election has been a tough battle. And it's, it is the case that I am so blessed to have uh, Labor Party members at a local level uh, who are so committed 
to making sure that the LNP don't get into government either, you know, through a majority of their own right or through the election of, you know, crossbenchers, including the Greens political party, uh, whom they are preferencing. Mm. So in my seat, it's very funny because we've got the LNP preferencing the Greens political party. We've got Clive Palmer and One Nation preferencing the Greens political party because they know that um, one less seat in South Brisbane means they can form government faster. And we only have a majority of two, so we only need to, to lose government by one. Um, and if they can govern with a motley crew of crossbench MPs, then they will do it. And that's a real, real threat to our democracy and the stability of our state, particularly at a time when our health and economic um, system needs stability more than anything else. For those listening uh, in Queensland who haven't jumped on a campaign just yet and want to get involved in the uh, Jackie Trad for South Brisbane, how, how can they get involved? Well, just go to my website. There's lots of information and prompts to sign up and uh, volunteer. Um, we are targeting about uh, 2,000 direct voter conversations between now and polling day. Um, you know, even if you're in another state, but you uh, are really passionately committed to, um, you know, social democratic change and you want to make sure that a Labor government is re-elected in Queensland, then we'd love to have your help on the phones. It would just be enormously beneficial for us and very, very valuable. Uh, so, yeah, go to my website. Um, it's very easy to volunteer and someone will get back to you very soon. What, what is, do you know, do you know the, what's the URL? Of your website. Oh, it's, sorry, it's it, it's jackietrade.com.au. Lovely, fantastic. Very easy. Well, Jackie, we do uh, really appreciate you taking time out of the campaign to come and talk to us today. Um, um, I know that um, you know every minute is precious in a campaign, so I do um, I really appreciate that. Um, and we wish you the best of luck in South Brisbane, and we wish Queensland Labor the best of luck right across the state in the lead up to the election campaign, and hopefully we get a result for the Palaszczuk government on October 31. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thanks for listening, everyone.